and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest is Dr. Diane Marie Trafflett, author of Edith Stein, A Spiritual Portrait, and it's published by Pauline Press. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice uh, you know, when you too. first walked in, I, I didn't recognize you as being somebody who'd been here at EWTN, but you told me a secret, right? Yes. You have been here before. I have been here, and I have to tell you that I was jealous of the person I was on with uh -huh. because she wrote a phenomenal book on Edith Stein. And that was Janet Bankovic's show years ago yes. when she was doing The Abundant Life, right? Yes, okay. and then on the commercial break, we spoke about her idea for Women of Grace. Grace, which so was now beautiful. Is in, in full flower as yes. a ministry she has, along with the radio show and the TV show that she right. does for us as well. Yeah. So we're happy that you were inspired and decided, uh, doctor, now you've got a doctorate in law, right? And, yes. and in theology. Okay, Correct. so I've got to be careful here. <laughs> you can get me on either, tired on either sign here, a tired attorney. Okay, one of the things I would say is that St. Edith Stein, a spiritual portrait, people hear her name Edith Stein. Now some people who are very particular say, well, her name's really St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Yes. I'm assuming you named it St. Edith Stein because nobody knows that other name, they right? Don't, they don't know the other name, and they do think of Teresa of Avila or Therese of Lisieux, Teresa of the Andes, so it gets kind of confusing. Right, but right. Edith Stein, I think, would have appreciated mm -hmm. if I did use her religious name. Mm -hmm. It meant a lot to her. Right. Teresa right. after Teresa of Avila, Benedict after St. Benedict, and of the cross. All three of those parts of the name are very important to her. Right, right. Now you actually did, what, your doctorate on her, right? Yes. Okay, and that was, now what made you interested in her even back then to write your doctorate on her? Your, your doctorate you know, I wrote a, a, a license first mm -hmm. at the Angelicum in Rome, and I decided that was it, no mm -hmm. more education. And I went, after I, I passed the exams for my license, I went to the bar at the Angelicum, mm -hmm. And I grabbed a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. and I kind of toasted myself that that was it. Mm -hmm. But as I finished that last drop of coffee, there was a tap on my shoulder, and the priest, who's the rector of the Angelicum, encouraged me to go on for my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. I'm done with education. And um, he was right. Mm -hmm. Came back home, and I decided I'm going to read all the spiritual literature that I haven't gotten to. And I put uh, them on my desk in order of importance. The last one was on Edith Stein, mm -hmm. the one I was not interested in at all. And I thought, I should know a little bit about her. And mm -hmm. I started to read her, and I thought, I couldn't put it down. Right. I thought, I'm going back to Rome. The rector was right. I'm going to write my doctorate on Edith. This was when she was blessed, Edith right, Stein. Right, exactly. Okay, what made you decide to put it into a book form? Did the publisher approach you, or was this your idea? Uh, this was my idea to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, as I gave lectures on Edith Stein, a lot of people kept coming to me saying, we got to get the word out. Because you're at Seton Hall, right? I am at Seton Hall at okay. the Immaculate Conception Seminary. Okay. Uh, people are interested in her story, but they're a little scared of her because mm -hmm. she's a brilliant philosopher. Mm -hmm. And so people keep saying, no, Edith Stein's brilliant. I can't relate she's to too her. Deep. She's too, too deep. deep for me. Too intellectual. Mm -hmm. She's not. Okay. She is very relatable from a spiritual perspective. Well, and that's what I count on. Well, right at the beginning you say, Edith Stein would have known how to begin this book. Thank what, you. What do you mean by that? That is my favorite line in the mm. entire book. Mm. Uh, I wrote that when I was on pilgrimage with seminarians from St. Andrew's Seminary at Seton Hall. Um, I could not figure out how to write the beginning. Written the entire book, not the beginning. Mm -hmm. And finally, during the pilgrimage, I thought Edith Stein would have known how to begin this book. I thought, that's my beginning, because she believed every day we get to begin again. Mm -hmm. Every day is a new opportunity to grow with God, to be led by God, and it's usually a surprise, right. usually not what we anticipate. The book was written by a beginner for beginners, right? Yeah. She was talking about finite and eternal being. Yeah. And you say also, Edith realized that the spiritual journey is for novices, those who never stop pondering, yeah. searching, and discovering. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a search really, in a fear not to become experts in humility. Right. And that's really what a lot of her story is about, right? Exactly. Uh, I always tell people the foundation of the spiritual life is humility. Right. Three words you got to keep in mind. Humility, humility, humility. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact you that... You weren't a real estate agent. Yeah, right, right? exactly. <laughs> location, location, location. <laughs> exactly. Right? Okay, okay. And then the location uh, right. <laughs> is next to the heart of Christ. Eventually she realized that. But, uh, you know, for all the accolades that she got as this great phenomenologist, a great speaker, mm -hmm. um, top of her class, summa cum laude, this was a woman of great humility and great self-possession. 
uh, she didn't want to think that she had become someone. Mm -hmm. She realized this is all about God, just laying her life in God's hand and letting herself be, be led by right. Him. Right, they recognize that to walk in the light, they must first stumble in the dark. When their pace is too quick, they realize they need to slow down and sometimes start again. Yeah. Uh, this woman of great success and great love lived an adventure in humility. What's an adventure yeah. in humility? Isn't that great? Uh, her whole life was an adventure, and she realized that our life of the faith is not boring. Mm -hmm. If we really have surrendered ourselves to God, every day becomes one of surprises, one where we're realizing God's presence mm -hmm. in others, in our lives, in various situations. There are no coincidences. She says, you know, she almost says, it's a pity for those who are content to live a life of superficiality. Because mm -hmm. once you start going deep, life becomes an adventure. But many people are afraid to go deep because yeah. they're afraid of what their adventure yeah. may be. Yeah, that's so, a good point. She was here, courageous. Basically, she said, it is always a simple truth that I have to express, how to go about living at the Lord's hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. unpack that for us. Yeah, when she was giving lectures, in fact, she got a couple of people who were criticizing her. You know, that wasn't so deep. Mm -hmm. And she says, you know, that is it. If we can live at the Lord's hand, allow ourselves to be empty before Him, allow His grace to permeate our lives, then we really start to live. Mm -hmm. And when people criticized her again, she said, if I can't speak about the supernatural in this way, then I'm not going to mount a lecture platform ever again. Mm -hmm. So, um, Well, it says here, this spiritual biography there does not, therefore does not seek to provide a strict chronology of Edith Stein's life, although the opening chapters offer a broad view of most significant events. You do, you say, consider Edith Stein's growing appreciation of the Eucharist, her deepening relationship with the Blessed Mother, her understanding, indeed, her premoni premonition of the suffering that she would endure. Mm -hmm. And of course, yes. Edith Stein was a convert. She was right. born Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, too, because it seems like in, in, you talk about in her life where, uh, I, I know her father died when she, she was very young, what, she yes. was maybe two or something Correct. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a very interesting photograph in there where, where they insert his yes. passport yes. picture yes. into yeah. the picture in the yeah. book, right? Yeah. They did a, a good job. Picture, you know, right? yes, yeah, you yes. had to look at it twice yes. uh, to see. Yeah. But also the idea that that for a woman like herself, and it talks about her interior life in the sense mm. that you know she could see a drunkard on the street. And you Which talk about young. young and how that would bother her mm. for all that period of time. She mm. would ruminate over that. It, mm -hmm. Those things would bother her, and people didn't understand that that was what's going on inside her because that's not how she appeared on the outside. Correct. So there was a supernatural uh, depth to her mm -hmm. early on, uh, even as a young child, even probably before she even started school. You're right, even seeing a drunk could mm -hmm. just so bother her. Um, but she wouldn't talk about it. She would, as mm -hmm. you said, just ponder it. Um, but there were lots of reasons why her life was not so easy growing wow. up. Wow. Her father died, but also her, f her father's brother committed suicide, mother's brother committed suicide. She was aware of a young child who was being abused in the neighborhood. Her mother took that child in. Mm -hmm. uh, this girl was aware of the difficult side of life and and sin right. at, a, at a very early age. Right, in fact, she was involved, as you talk about, at a very, you know, in her teens, basically having intellectual discussions with adults. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it's also interesting, too, because I think about her, and you see about how her, strong her faith is, and she starts off at apparently strong in her faith, her Judaism, mm -hmm. uh, and besides being discriminated against, even though she was the top in her class, she didn't get the awards, etc., mm -hmm. those kind of things. Mm -hmm. She kind of walked away from that. She decided she wasn't going to pray anymore. Right. Now, during that period, was she an agnostic? Yeah. I would not call her an atheist. Okay. I would say that she was an agnostic. And you said it beautifully. Uh, she made a deliberate and conscious decision to stop praying. She didn't say at that stage at 15 mm -hmm. years old, I don't believe in God anymore. I just stop praying. And then later she would say, I, I don't believe anymore. But little by little, through her teens and um, 20s, she began to ponder some more, have good conversations. Lots of her friends were converting to Christianity and Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So the seeds were being planted. And why was that happening in your research on her and in that time? Because you talk about, in the book, also about other Catholic converts that she had relationships with and, and things like that. Were the, I was going to ask you, were those 
Jews converting to Catholicism that were friends of her? And why was that happening Both. at the time? Jews converting to Catholicism, Protestants converting to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of conversions of philosophers at the mm -hmm. time. I also, I think that going deep into your faith, pondering the questions, not being afraid to, to ask questions, I think all of that created faith-filled conversations mm -hmm. about virtue, about God, about grace. And whereas Edith wasn't wearing her heart on her sleeve at this mm -hmm. time, she was taking in those conversations. And in fact, she'd say, I don't have time to think about this, but they mm -hmm. were making an impression. Mm -hmm. That's the key for Edith, I think. The impressions of witnesses to the faith. Mm -hmm. um, people who love the Eucharist, for instance. One time she was asked, are you one of those uh, daily communicants club, part of the club mm -hmm. of daily communicants? And she said, no, but looking back, she said, I almost said, no, unfortunately. Right, right, I saw that, that yeah. line. Yeah, and that also was a period of time where the whole idea of, of frequent communion had only come back into vogue with St. Pius the Tenth, really, mm -hmm. earlier in the century. So mm -hmm. the idea of going yeah. to yes. Mass on a regular basis every day or receiving communion was also that was something that was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that struck me too, it says in 1891 she's born, 1922 is when she was baptized a Catholic. Now, she didn't enter religious life until 11 years later, yeah. but her first impetus was to become a religious, Correct. right? But yeah. But she had somebody tap on her shoulder too, right? Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> she did. I think I can relate to this. 1922 was when she became a Catholic following uh, her reading of Teresa of Avila's book. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to make it clear that Teresa of Avila was like the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. She had been um, developing a spiritual life long before Teresa of Avila. But when she read Teresa of Avila, she said, this is the truth. truth. She immediately wanted to become a Catholic and a Carmelite nun. A priest, she went to a priest, the priest said, listen, you need to stay in the secular world where your talents are needed, and secondly, this would kill your mother. And she thought about mm -hmm. that, would this actually kill my mother? And she says, no, it wouldn't kill her, but it would harden her heart, mm -hmm. and I could not be responsible for that. Okay. And that which is really beautiful, it's mm -hmm. very loving. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be the one who hardens my mother's heart. And she knew it would be very, very difficult for her mother. Wow. So she stayed in the secular wor world for about 10 to 11 years. But even to say that this was the secular mm -hmm. world is, is not quite right. She worked at a Dominican school for girls right, right. and lived with the Dominicans. Now she went there because that's where she could get a job. Yes, too, and, right? her, and her spiritual director helped her to get a job get there. there and the, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. She wanted to work at the university but right. couldn't because she was a woman. Yeah, I was going to say it wasn't because she was Jewish necessarily. It's because she was a woman. I know Correct. That, that had yeah. at that time. I thought this quote was interesting because you talked about uh, the whole idea of humility and there's an experience where which you recount in here when uh, Edith got a goodbye from one of her classmates, uh, gave her a bit of a, a talking to about yes. her critical attitude yes. and, and she, she kind of was taken aback and she says, so I had been living in the naive conviction that I was perfect. <laughs> and she said after that, and I had to really think about mm -hmm. this. This was an alarm. This was a first alert, and I took it seriously. Somebody dared to criticize me, mm -hmm. and I took that criticism to heart, and I made a decision to change. Uh, and this, by the way, I think is another reason why I find her so relatable. There are moments throughout her life where someone says something to her, and she has to think about it. Mm -hmm. How can I grow with that criticism? How can I become better? How can I learn not to be so sarcastic? How can I learn to be more virtuous? Mm -hmm. And uh, she was disciplined enough in her own life that she felt uh, that she had changed. Mm -hmm. Later she'll say, changed with the help of God, transformed with the help, help of God. Help of God, right, mm -hmm. exactly, that you can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. While she thirsted for solitary prayer, she also had a deep sense of the urgent need for self-sacrificial action in the world. And that's a theme throughout, and that you mentioned earlier about yes. that idea. Even in the cloister, when she becomes a Carmelite, she talks about how she's still going to, in, a, in effect, impact the world. Yes through prayer, through sacrifice, and I think it's a beautiful witness for us today when we say, how can we help the world? It mm -hmm. just seems like these problems are so dramatic. How can we, here today, help? Mm -hmm. And she would say, yeah, you want to be at all fronts. You can be mm -hmm. through prayer and through sacrifice. 
It says here that uh, the eternal light of God allows us to see the whole horizon. For the higher we climb, the more we are able to see the whole world. Mm -hmm. Go down further. The closer Edith drew to divine love, the more her eyes and her heart were opened, and the more she was ready to serve anywhere, even in dangerous circumstances. And, and she had, uh, I guess it was during World War I, actually served in the Red Cross. Right. Uh, right. Where she had put herself, where she could have been in danger, mm -hmm. where she wasn't uh, ultimately. So her understanding later on was when she would receive the Eucharist, it's divine love coming into her heart. And when she serves, it's not just mm -hmm. with her love, it's with God's love. And it's God's love that's making the impact. One of the stories you tell was uh, she got invited to midnight mass. Yeah. And uh, it turns out the, the, the church was closed. Yeah. And, and it wasn't. And there's a reference there to saying, is, is this another case where you were pondering whether she felt like another stone instead of bread? Correct. Is that something you picked up in her life story? Correct, correct, okay. yes. So uh, she was realizing along the way that sometimes when she asked a friend, a Jewish friend, do you believe in a personal God? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, God is spirit. Nothing more could be said on the matter. And she said she felt as though she had been given a stone rather than bread. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, then I thought, well, here she's trying to go to midnight mass and the doors are locked. Mm -hmm. Did she feel like she got a stone again? And she I, wasn't even Catholic at no, the time, right? No, she wasn't. But again, seeds were being planted. Right, drawn. Here's a quote you, you have. I, I even believe that the deeper one is drawn into God, the more one must go out of oneself. That is, one must go to the world in order to carry the divine life into it again. She has that. Again, one of my favorite quotes from Edith is to carry divine life into the world. So first, when she converted to Catholicism, she thought, I want to be a cloistered nun. I want to live totally immersed in thoughts of the divine. Mm -hmm. She says, you know, even if we do live like that, we have a responsibility to go out into the world. Even as a cloistered nun, there are ways to go out into the world mm -hmm. by prayer and sacrifice. We have a responsibility being close to God to go out. But I think it's, it's more than that. I think that once we are close to divine love, it's almost as though we can't help ourselves. Mm -hmm. Love is, is flowing from us. Mm -hmm. She understood that. Right. I think also sometimes with that, people sense that too, and there's a certain loss of almost control because one is so attracted and drawn to it, and, and we like to control things. And yeah. so, you know, Referring to St. Teresa of Avila, her name said, she urged, one would like to bring into our time something of the spirit of this great woman who built amazingly during a century of battles and disturbances. And of course, here she was in the cloister in the 1930s. The Nazis are running Germany. Mm -hmm. where We're moving pell-mell towards World War II, basically. Mm -hmm. And of course, the persecution of not only the world effectively, but the Holocaust is yes, coming. Yeah. So Teresa of Avila really had staying power in Ada Stein's life, and she wanted Teresa of Avila as her, as her name. Uh, that notion that here we have a mystic, Teresa of Avila, who built amazingly, was a woman of great strength, great love, uh, a powerful woman. And Ada said, we need someone like that today. We need to be like Teresa of Avila. We need her intercession and uh, believe, as you said, even at times uh, of horror, to look at, at mystics. Mm -hmm. uh, what what was the, were the impacts of their lives on their society and even today? Mm -hmm. Now, her situation, uh, now she ended up in the gas chamber at Auschwitz mm -hmm. in August 1942. The Nazis arrested her after the Dutch bishops spoke out about against Nazism. Right. Uh, it's interesting, too, because many times people criticize Pius XII say, well, he should have said more. And people don't realize that at different times people spoke out. Correct. And when it happened, uh, you know, many times uh, the Jewish communities would say, please don't say anything. Yes. You just make it worse. Absolutely. This is a prime example of that. So what happened was the, the Catholic leaders and the Protestant leaders got together in Holland and they decided to issue a joint telegram to the Nazi leaders protesting their treatment of the Jews. The Nazis responded by saying, if you dare to read this publicly, we will go after all Christians of Jewish descent mm -hmm. if they were recent converts. Mm -hmm. The Jewish leaders got, I mean, the, the Protestant leaders and the Catholic leaders got together again. The Protestants said, we can't, we can't risk the lives of our people. Mm -hmm. The Catholic leaders said, we must speak the truth. Mm -hmm. So they did, from all their pulpits one Sunday, they read the letter mm -hmm. of protest. Immediately thereafter, the Nazis got together. They have a secret order that says, because 
the Catholic bishops interfered in something that is none of their business, all Catholics of Jewish descent will be rounded up and no reprieves will be given. Mm -hmm. It was distinctly Catholic. It was a Catholic, against the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. And Edith uh, was rounded up uh, the next day. Right. And, and in fact, it was something similar to that with Anne Frank, too, because th they had spoken out and that was yeah. one of the things of why there, there, there had been so much oppression. Where did you, the, 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 the pictures that are in the book, um, did you work on acquiring those? Did you find them? The, the you did publisher, the research the publisher that, found them in archives, and I, I see that you're open to one page. Mm -hmm. um, that's Edith at a party when she was a Red Cross uh, nurse. Mm -hmm. Edith was not, as we say today, a partier. Yes. Edith did not <laughs> want to go to that party. So, for the for your your listeners, sometime when they when mm. they uh, read the book, you're going right. to see a picture of her where she, if looks could kill, um, mm. she was dragged to that party, and afterwards she says, "I will never go there again. I simply came here to serve." Right. This is prior to her becoming a Catholic. On on the page opposite that, there's a uh, wonderful picture of her that was taken. Uh, but it, it, she was working her thesis on the problem of empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that about? So Edith was, again, a great philosopher. And at this point, we don't see in her doctoral dissertation on empathy uh, any inkling until the very end that she's considering uh, a life of faith. Mm -hmm. The very end of her doctorate, she speaks about how can we be empathize, how can we put ourselves in, in another per person's situation if they are a believer and we are not? Mm. And she kind of leaves it open-ended. And I thought, you know, she's trying in her own way at this time to consider relating to people of faith. Mm. But just from a, from a secular perspective, um, Edith was a, a saint of empathy. Mm. Edith Stein knew how to accompany people in their struggles. She could understand really well what they were going through. She was an empathetic soul. Mm -hmm. So it would have been fun to have seen uh, an, another doctorate coming from her after her, mm -hmm. uh, from a spiritual perspective, right. after her uh, conversion to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Well, also, and you talk about in the book how, in a sense, she was premonitioned to kind of suffer and the cross with our Lord and also because she was born on the Jews, Jewish feast of Yom Kippur which is the day of atonement, atonement so yeah. there was a connection really all the way from there. Now it, towards the end of the book I don't want to give it away but it, you talk about Edith Stein's message for today. What, yeah. what do you think her message is for people watching this program yeah. today? You know I've, I've been wondering about what would what would she see, what would bother her about today's society? Well, first, uh, sometimes people call her a feminist, and, and I shy away from that because I'm afraid that sometimes when we call people feminists today, it, it's related to the pro-abortion movement. Right, as a uh, bad connotation, yeah. it can, right. But Edith was very concerned about children. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, she talked about children who were spiritual orphans. That there are people, there are children mm -hmm. who have parents, but still they're spiritual orphans. And she called upon uh, teachers to really be uh, surrogate mothers in a way. But I look at today's society and I see uh, you know, all the problems that young people have. Mm -hmm. uh, all over the world you see uh, children being sold into sex slave labor. Uh, you see human trafficking. Mm -hmm. You see children today uh, being involved in things that uh, mm -hmm. are, are horrific. Right. And I would, I would say that Edith reminds us not to objectify anyone and to fight for the rights of children, for the family, uh, for uh, the pro-life movement. I'm sure she would have been involved in it. And never to neglect the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, we can get really yeah, discouraged. That's, that's really a major theme in here. We and it's interesting because that was what she gave up during that period. Yes, in between, isn't right? it? Right. Yeah. She discovered a personal God eventually. But I think that she would look and be able to name all the difficulties in today's society, but remind us, power of prayer, power of, of the Holy Spirit, and the power of spiritual friendship. There's a whole theme in Edith Stein's life of, of friendship. Mm -hmm. And she would encourage us, talk with one another, and pray with one another, pray for one another. Don't neglect the spiritual life, in, in particularly in times of darkness. So from the time you decided you were going to turn this into book form and you, you took your original source material that you had done, how long did it take you to shape this into this book as we see it today? Years. Really? It, it took years. Even though it's a small book, it, it took years. 
Uh, I do have to say there's a new book that just came out uh, of Edith Stein's letters to Roman Ingarden. Mm -hmm. Those letters really tell you a lot about Edith Stein's heart. Mm -hmm. And I do want to just really stress that. Mm -hmm. Edith was a woman with a great heart, mm -hmm. a, great, a woman of great empathy, a woman of great compassion. And when you start plummeting the depths of someone's mm -hmm. heart, it is hard to get right. it on paper. And at the same time, a great intellect. Correct. Okay. Yes. Well, are you working on another book? I am. Edith Stein and work. Okay. Very yeah. good. Well, thank you, Dr. Diane Marie Traflett, for thank stopping you. by EWTN's book Thank Market. you for having me. Oh, great to have you here uh, speaking with our author about St. Edith Stein, a spiritual portrait, and it's available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Join us next time right here on EWTN's Book Market.